Taxi Driver is one of the most important films that's ever been made. Not only is it a masterpiece in every way a film can be, but it also carries a deep and layered message. Because Taxi Driver was one of the first films to give a clear picture of modern loneliness. The claustrophobic cinematography, the carefully chosen harsh lighting, all of it works to put the audience into the main character Travis's viewpoint. Through his eyes, we see the grim and grit of New York and how disconnected he is from the society. The various meanings and levels that Taxi Driver is working on are impossible to sum up through one lens. But what can be said for sure is that Taxi Driver gives a vivid betrayal of the stages of loneliness, a grim story of masculinity's conflict with a modern world, where men have seemingly lost all of their meaning in life. And that's exactly what we're going to be discussing. In the first scene of the movie, we're immediately given a feel for the atmosphere. A dominant plantative soundtrack overlays an almost dreamlike sequence. Travis's cab pushes through a wall of smoke, and we see the blurred lights of the city through what's presumably the windshield. We're then taken to our first proper scene with Travis, where he is applying to be a taxi driver. At first, this is a tense exchange. The interviewer is blunt with his questions and asks Travis why he wants to work the night shift. Travis replies that he can't sleep and spends all night going around the city anyway. The interviewer replies, asking why he doesn't just go to an adult theatre. Why doesn't he just numb himself to adult entertainment like everybody else? Summing up this depressing atmosphere of modern New York. And the interview seemed like it's failing, until Travis mentions that he was a marine. His interviewer and future boss says that he was too and tells Travis to come back the next day to start work. And this scene is important because it gives us a first picture of who Travis really is. He's a loner with little educational family. He's someone who served for his country, a hardened veteran who's now being punished by the society that he fought so hard to protect, clearly suffering from insomnia, paranoia, and a whole host of other mental issues. In the next scene, we see Travis's apartment. It's run down and grotty, just like the other parts of New York. And it's here where we hear the contents of Travis's diary, which shows he's now well into his taxi job and apparently works long shifts nearly every night. During this scene, we see the people of New York at night from Travis's perspective, as he monologues about them being animals sick, vanal, and scum. He even talks wistfully about a rain that will come to wash them off at the streets. His disdain for his customers is palpable. All the animals come out at night. Whores, skunk pussies, buggers, queens, fairies, dopers, junkies. And we get a brief glimpse for why as he picks up a man and a prostitute, where he has to clean the seats up every night from all this debauchery, the degeneracy that's plagued this modern mega city, the city, the society, the people he sacrificed his entire life for. Having no meaning and no purpose, the only pleasure and satisfaction he can get is by going to an adult theatre and unsuccessfully flirting with women. But deep down, he knows this isn't enough. He knows there's something deeply empty within himself and the world around him, as he sits in the grim light of the projector, failing to ever fall asleep. Because Travis's life as a taxi driver is revealing the veil of modern life. The societal delusions of grace and decency are fading away, and Travis sees things for what it really is, and it's nasty. We then hear more of Travis's inner thoughts. He clearly longs for a sense of purpose, as he says, all my life needed was a sense of some place to go. He also resents people who are too self-pitiful and says that people should become a person like other people. And it's this sentiment that makes up the first stage of loneliness. So Societies and Travis's lack of purpose. Existentialism has a long history of discussing loneliness, and is at the core of many famous existentialist philosophies. And it's this all encompassing existential loneliness that is the heart of Taxi Driver. Travis has run into problems that existentialists believe everyone has. Humans by default are lonely. Your consciousness, your innermost thoughts, and the core of yourself is innately lonely. You're born and you die on your own. With your conscious being entirely singular and private, no one can truly know what it's like to be you and what your thoughts really are. And in the same way, you can never truly know what it's like to be someone else. And when you live in a society that promotes alienation, loneliness, cheating on your wives, and lacking any sense of community, these problems are then compounded. And it's this disconnection that creates an existential loneliness in modern society. Travis has run into this exact problem. Sartre discusses it in his masterpiece Being and Nothingness. In it, he makes a distinction between conscious people and unconscious objects that underpins existentialist thought. Regular objects are seen as being for itself. They fulfill their purpose by merely existing and have no agency over their identity or awareness of it. A tree can't help but be a tree, for example, and it isn't aware of its own existence. The interesting part is how people are seen through this theory. People are seen as being for itself. Consciousness gives people the ability to decide their own purpose and awareness of themselves. But this has some side effects. Sartre famously said that existence precedes essence, and by that he meant that people are born first and have to figure out what their purpose is. And whilst this is freedom in a way, it also leaves people less than whole, and in need of some sort of fulfilling purpose, as we'll find out throughout the film. And as a result of this, your consciousness, your innermost thoughts, and the core of yourself is innately lonely. This is because consciousness is entirely singular and private. No one can truly know what it's like to be you and what your thoughts are. Thus your purpose in life, the meaning, 
the fulfillment that you take from life is all determined by you and only you. And because no one ever truly knows what it's like to be someone else, this necessary disconnection from each other is what creates an existential need to be complete. And the most logical way that people achieve this is through meaningful relationships. But Travis doesn't have these. He often comes across as awkward and doesn't have close friends or family to express himself to. Instead, his only identity is being a taxi driver. The purpose he once had, fighting for his country in the brutal Vietnam War, sacrificing his body, his mind, his soul, all for the betterment of the society that he lives in, now no longer exists. That purpose has been stripped back from him. And that's why Travis, like more and more people today, lacks any meaningful connections with the people around him, because there is no binding spirit connecting him with a greater purpose. And this has left him starving for something to give his life some sort of purpose, so he can be a person like other people. But instead, he's left by himself with his own thoughts and his awful environment. As we'll find out across the rest of the movie, his attempts to find meaning will often be thwarted by what he's picked up from his environment. In the next scene in the movie, we see the first object of Travis's longing, Betsy. Betsy works on the presidential campaign for a man called Senator Palantine. She's introduced wearing white, the color of purity, and Travis immediately sees her as somehow above the rest of the world. It's seemingly love at first sight. She's a ray of light in Travis's dark, bleak life, a symbol of how his life could be better. Betsy then only notices Travis when she catches him staring at her. And just by looks alone, Travis is enthralled with her. And after finishing his shift, he takes a break to grab a coffee with some fellow cab drivers. But it's clear from the beginning that their relationships are entirely shallow. Travis doesn't even respond to questions and leaves long pauses. Eventually, Travis mentions a story about a cabbie who got assaulted, and in response, one of his friends tells him he can get Travis a gun if he would like, considering the dangerous parts of town that he's working in. But it seems like Travis is barely listening as his voice blends in with the fizzing of some alka seltzer Travis is about to drink, with his only thoughts focused on Betsy. And this is why in the next scene, we see that Travis has decided to do something about his lack of meaning. He walks into the campaign office and asked to volunteer, but it's just a pretense to talk to Betsy. But to Travis's credit, it starts to work. Travis is confident and upfront, making the bold accusation that Betsy is lonely and needs a meaningful connection in her life. And because Betsy, like everyone else in postmodern New York, feels this way, Betsy realizes that Travis is tapping into the subconscious disconnection that's felt by everyone. And so they agree to a first date at a coffee shop in the first truly meaningful conversation of the movie. At this point, it seems like Travis might have found an answer to what he needs. Just finding another person who shares his existential situation presents itself as a possible cure for his loneliness. But as we find out, his emptiness stretches far above loneliness. As they go on their first date, Travis tries to relate to Betsy's problems. I don't believe I've ever met anyone quite like you. Betsy is taken aback by how open and forward Travis is, but she agrees with the feeling and agrees to a second date. She knows that Travis understands her full consciousness. He's tapping into the unspoken. However, it isn't all great, as Betsy mentions to Travis that he reminds her of a song, as Travis is clearly a walking contradiction, and the following events will only prove her right. But it's in this part of the film where Travis begins this second stage of existential loneliness. He's desperately trying to fill the hole by attaching himself to Betsy and deciding that she's the answer to all of his problems. But his thoughts about her aren't conducive to building such a relationship. Instead, he has placed her on a pedestal, an object of affection and beauty far above everyone else. By being with her, he'll be complete. The emptiness, the dreariness, the degeneracy of his life will fade away in the light of her presence. He completely idealizes her, placing her in contrast to his dark and gritty environment. In this way, Travis was a dark prediction for millions of men today. With all these men living these dreary, horrible, unpurposeful lives. Lives of quiet desperation that are just doomed to fall into the same patterns as Travis. And I'm not just talking about insults. The real problem lies with how masculinity is treated in the modern world. For millions of years, men in life had one one real purpose, protecting and growing their family structure and their community. They were born into a close-knit environment where they would make meaningful connections and find meaning through preserving and protecting them. They would have culture, they would have traditions, they would always feel alive. The word suicide didn't even exist. But today, millions of men are born into fractured families and often find themselves alone in the world, with almost no real friends, no one to express themselves to, seeing all these people in these giant megacities, but feeling completely detached from everyone they pass, with nobody to protect or love with nobody to communicate, to converse with, with no one to find a deep spiritual connection with, men are now finding their lives to be empty of meaning and have absolutely no outlet for their masculinity. Instead, this is repressed, repressed at schools, repressed in the media, repressed by the twisted societal customs. And this process often leaves them lacking in any social skills as a result of their increased 
isolation. And this is why men are latching onto phantoms, overlaying qualities onto random women and creating an illusion of meaningful connection. And when this collides with reality, the consequences can be awful for everyone involved. In this way, Travis has begun pursuing Betsy as an answer to his problems. He wants a meaningful connection and is desperate to relate to what Betsy has seen in him. Travis buys and listens to the songs that Betsy talks about, and also gains a new interest in the political candidate she works for. But all of this seems for nothing as their next date goes incredibly poorly. Travis, who seems like he doesn't know any better, tries to take Betsy to an adult theatre on their first proper date, and she leaves only after a minute. And we next see Travis leaving her messages on the phone and sending her flowers despite her rejection. I just, listen, uh, I'm I'm sorry about the, the other night, I didn't know that was the way you felt about it. Travis is anxious, his purpose is fading, the emptiness is crawling back. He even goes to work to confront her, but it seems like he's done putting her on a pedestal, instead telling her plainly, Treat you like the rest of them and later writes in his diary that she's just as cold and distant like all the other people. Travis's mental state seems to take a turn for the worse. However, later that night, he picks up a man who seems much more deranged than he. The man makes Travis pull over and tells him that his wife is cheating on him in the building they're parked outside. He tells Travis that he's got a gun and he's gonna kill his wife. I'm gonna kill her, I'm gonna kill her with a 44 Magnum pistol. I have a 44 Magnum pistol, I'm gonna kill her with that gun. He talks about his 44 Magnum and its gruesome effects, with this just being yet another sick encounter for Travis, further confirming his resentment towards the world around him. Travis's slow response and general apathy towards the murder just shows how truly disconnected from the world he is. And in the next scene, Travis doesn't even mention this, it's just part and parcel of living in New York, where no one cares for each other, where it's normal to cheat on your wives, and where no one feels any affinity to their common man. And this is why Travis starts to become more and more deranged, as we see in his apartment where he's eating white bread, milk, and what looks like brandy. It's all this built up resentment and Travis's lack of purpose that has sent him to rock bottom. He's numbing himself with instant gratification. And while he eats, he watches his speech by Palantine in silence, filled with resentment and hate. And we see this in Travis's diary, where he just wallows in self-pity and anger at his rejection and his place in the world. The days move along with regularity, over and over. One day indistinguishable from the next. A long, continuous chain. But as this resentment reaches its breaking point, he decides that he's gonna change. He's gonna use this hatred, this anger, this energy towards transforming his life. And this is the turning point in the movie, where Travis's new purpose takes hold. But before I continue, I want to shout out today's sponsor, Established Titles. Established Titles is a project based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to lairds, lords, or ladies. What Established Titles does is give you one square foot of land so you can call yourself a lord or a lady and provide you an official certificate with a crest. Once you have your certificate, you'll have a unique plot number to see the exact location of your land. By owning this land, Established Titles allows you to change your name to lord or lady on credit cards, plane tickets, even dating profiles, and so much more. And even better is that Established Titles Titles plants a tree with every order and works with global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support reforestation efforts. And right now, Established Titles told me that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot, just within a few minutes of walking distance. And so depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build our own little moon kingdom. It makes an amazing last minute gift, and right now they have a massive Black Friday sale. Plus, if you use code BLACKMOON, you'll get an additional 10% off, so go to Established Titles titles.com forward slash black moon. Travis starts by buying a gun from a shady salesman. He first mentions the 44 Magnum, mirroring what the deranged man from before had talked about earlier, eventually buying four guns from the man. But this is just the beginning of Travis's transformation. He begins working out at home, doing push-ups and using free weights. He vows to cut out junk food and the pills he takes. There will be no more pills, there will be no more bad food, no more destroyers of my body. He's not going to numb himself anymore. He's going to face all the emotions he feels raw. He even holds his fist over an open flame, practicing his resistance to pain, and discomfort. And when he's not working out his body and mind, he's spending his time at the gun range training his aim. It's clear that he's preparing for something. But before we find out what it is, we need to talk about what just happened. Because this transformation process is the third stage of loneliness. It all comes from resentment. Travis was already resentful before he even met Betsy. He resented the world he lived in, the people he saw every day, and the fact that no one treated him like a real person. He felt more and more atomized. The country he fought so hard to protect had rejected him and threw him to the streets. There was no 
common purpose or community with his fellow man. He was detached from everyone he saw. And this is one of the reasons that Travis still wears his military clothing. It's almost like he's mourning his loss of purpose by clinging to his lost identity. And all of this has been compounded by Betsy's rejection of him. What seemed like an answer to his purposeless life had just slapped him around the face. And for a long time, this leaves Travis in a depressive state. Travis's exercise routine and his discipline gives his life a new purpose. It lets him channel all the energy he has from his insomnia and his dark thoughts. And it's through the structure that Travis actually finds fulfillment. And this is one of the key stages out of his existential loneliness. As Sartre said, man must find purpose by himself. And now that Travis has found it, he can finally find meaning in his life. Although this is a double-edged sword, it all depends on the purpose. If Travis had decided to better himself on a new purpose that helps the people around him, that connects him to the society that he lives in, it might have actually worked. An end goal that doesn't involve violence or letting out resentment on other people is key. But unfortunately, we'll find out that Travis's new purpose isn't any more healthy than his aimless resentment. In fact, it's working towards this purpose that is a key step in Travis's mental anguish affecting other people. Travis's negative experience have not only fueled his resentment, but they've also impacted his ability to find a purpose. His life has been so negative that he can only find purpose in destroying what he thinks caused his pain. And that's why the following section of the movie is a warning. A warning about modern societies that don't give men purpose, as without it, these men are often left with nothing but anger. When a generation of atomized men with no attachment to the culture around them burgeons, men's purpose becomes to burn said culture to feel its warmth. And we can see that in Travis's newfound purpose, with his first plan being to assassinate Palatine. The senator is already synonymous in Travis's mind with Betsy. She held him in high regard, devoting her career to furthering his. So Travis's plan to kill him is generally a plan to destroy the idea of Betsy. He stakes out a camp campaign rally and talks to a secret service agent in preparation. And this is followed by possibly the most famous scene in the movie. Travis talks to his reflection as he points the gun at the mirror, saying the iconic words, you talking to me? clearly showing how far down the rabbit hole of loneliness Travis has gone. And later on, we see Travis talking to a relatively new character. He's a pimp called Sport, and Travis has taken an interest in a child that he's been pimping. Travis pays the pimp and follows the girl up to an apartment. He finds out that the girl is called Iris, and it's been clear that he's been pining her after a while. Earlier in the movie, Iris had gotten into Travis's cab and asked him to get her out of there. But then the pimp pulled her out and threw Travis some money. And ever since, Travis had been building up a new way out of his existential loneliness by imagining himself as a savior for the girl. But when Travis eventually tells her that he's there to help her, she doesn't seem to want any help. However, they seem to like each other and so they agree to meet up again. And when they meet, Travis tells her to go back to her parents, but Iris doesn't like the idea. And this prompts Travis to begin talking about how much he hates sports, the pimp, and what scummy truly is. It seems like Travis's anger and resentment are redirecting yet again, this time towards sport. And this forms the second part of Travis's plan, to kill sport as well as Palantine. And to begin this plan, Travis starts preparing himself, getting his weapons ready. He cuts his hair into a mohawk and puts on his army uniform. This represents the Vietnam War, where soldiers who were going on suicide missions would cut their hair in the same way, as it's clear that Travis doesn't have any plans on escaping. And as Palantine descends the stage and walks through the crowd, Travis moves over, holding his gun under his jacket. However, the secret service agent that Travis talked to from before spots him and tells the other security personnel. Travis quickly notices this and runs, only narrowly escaping. And so with his first first goal dashed on the rocks, Travis instead moves onto his second plan, saving Iris. This is Travis's chance to do something virtuous once again, something to get back at all the scum, to burn down the degeneracy in his city and feel its warmth. So he takes his gun, kills Sport, and then heads into the apartment. And what ensues can only be described as a chaotic and bloody fight scene. After the gunfight is over, Travis emerges victorious, although gravely wounded. When the police finally show up, he's sitting on a couch, covered in blood, as a terrified Iris cowers in the corner. But it turned out this mission wasn't a suicide mission after all, as Travis makes a full recovery. And when he gets out of the hospital, he finds out that he's become a hero, a modern cowboy who battled with gangsters. He even gets a letter from Iris's parents, who thank him for what he did and tell him that Iris is safe at home. Everything seems like it's gone perfectly. His purpose was fulfilled. Travis has become victorious and done something to tackle the degeneracy plaguing his city. And Travis even has a chance to see Betsy once again, who shows up in his cab. It seems like Travis might have finally found peace. The emptiness is dissolved and a meaningful life ensues. But as the film comes to an end and Travis drives off into the night, we see a majestic mirror and his eyes light up in rage once again. It seems like nothing has changed after all for Travis, who still holds onto the anger and resentment inside of him. And that's what's so depressing about this film. The ending of Taxi Driver shows us that this cycle of loneliness can go on repeatedly and the chain never stops stops because Travis's purpose was recited and violent. It didn't give him any fulfillment when it was finished. He's still resentful and violent. All this was was a temporary solution to a deep-rooted problem. This still wasn't a proper 
a purpose, and thus he's doomed to repeat the cycle forever. And it's this exact process that's happening for millions of ostracized men today, who lack any clear purpose and reason for existing, left to drift aimlessly into resentment and anger by political ideologies. And as we see in Taxi Driver and the real world, this process often ends in tragic violence, and it's almost never virtuous. Taxi Driver shows that the solution is to work on yourself to make meaningful connections with the people around you. But when you live in an atomized society that's devoid of any human connection, any sense of community, and any binding purpose, every purpose you have becomes meaningless. And that's why coming from a world of rejection and loneliness makes this difficult process even harder. But once you find the right purpose, a long-term goal for your future self, you'll soon realize that this is the only way out of the cycle of loneliness. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more controversial videos that I can't release to the public, consider joining the channel. For just $5.99 a month, you'll have access to monthly exclusive videos not released to the public, where you can watch our videos on Tech Kaczynski and our Mr. Robot series review, and soon we'll be releasing a video on the man behind Gay Frogs. In addition to the exclusive videos, you'll also have access to my private Discord group. All you have to do is click the join button below or click the link in the description.